Amen. Does your heart cry out for more of Jesus? I pray it does. If it does, you'll connect with that song like you won't many others. This is the air I breathe. Do you ever just stop and just breathe in the presence of God? Uh, I don't know how people live without it. I don't know. Thank God I don't have to. Amen. Thank God. Our scripture text for the message today comes out of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, beginning at verse 6. It says this, He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, yet filled with afraid, excuse me, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the soldiers and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This is the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, it's very obvious. Matthew is telling us about the day of the resurrection and the ways in which the believers found out that Jesus was alive and well. The resurrection was first announced to the women who had gone to the tomb by an angel that had met them there. The angel commanded the ladies to go and to tell the others. So they, they take off to do so. And it was only while they were doing what they were told to do that Jesus revealed himself to them while they were on their way to the other disciples. And I, I'm sure everything in them wanted to run and wanted to hide out of fear for what the Roman soldiers might be ordered to do next. Instead, the women chose to be faithful and do what the angel told them to do, so they were on their way to the brothers. Listen, church, we will always encounter Christ in some form or fashion when we are willing to go and tell others about the resurrected Savior. You will encounter Christ when you are doing the work you are told to do. And you will encounter Christ in ways you will never encounter Christ otherwise. Being faithful is where you want to be. That's where you will be the closest to Christ you've ever been. I've always found that Jesus seems closest to me when I'm, I'm being faithful to the Spirit's leading and I'm faithfully fulfilling God's will for my life in that moment. If you want to be closer to God, get up and do something to encourage other people's faith and their witness uh, and witness God's love to them in the activities that you participate in your life. You won't be sorry you did. You might encounter some pushback now and then. I'll grant you that. But the closeness that comes from a faithful walk is worth more than any possible dis discomfort that you might undergo at some point in time. Matthew tells us that the ladies were, and I'm quoting, afraid yet filled with joy. Did you hear that? Does that sound like a dichotomy going on there, a little mixture? Afraid yet filled with joy. Puzzling a bit, isn't it? And they were afraid, filled with joy, when they ran to tell the disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Jesus appeared to them to help them with their fear and with their faith in the words already given to them by the angel. In other words, he wanted to help them with their fear, to encourage them, to increase their faith, so they would be faithful to continue on this trek that they were sent upon. 
His presence affirmed what they had already been told, and, and I speculate that Jesus couldn't wait to personally tell those that were seeking him about his resurrected status. I'm, I'm guessing he was just chomping at the bit for these poor ladies who were so scared to tell them, I'm alive, it's okay. Fear not. Fear not. There's a clear lesson for all believers here. Jesus doesn't want us fearful. He doesn't want you afraid. He wants to encourage you in your faith. He wants to, to build you up in your spirit. He doesn't want you being afraid. Whenever people have close encounters with God in Scripture, you almost always hear an angel or maybe Jesus say, Fear not or do not be afraid. If social media, if life, or the TV has you bound up in fear, seek Christ and ask Him to deliver you from the fear. He wants to deliver you from fear because you will be paralyzed in your fears. They will freeze you up if they eat at you long enough, if you remain in your fear. Ask Christ to deliver you because fear is not of God. That's in the Scriptures. And not something that will serve you or allow you to be in service to God under. Jesus told us not to fear man. He said, don't be afraid of anything or anyone but God. And only be afraid of him, really, if you're living outside of his will for your life. To be true to the word of God, I'll tell you exactly what he said. In Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, Jesus is quoted as saying, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So you see, we fear only God, only when we are outside of his will for our lives. That's when you need to be concerned. But for believers who are walking in the glory and the grace of God, we are not to be in fear. We are to be victor, victorious, more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Fear should not hold us down or be a part of our lives. These women were where they were supposed to be, doing what they were told to do. And though they were afraid of the Romans and their fury, Jesus appeared to them to calm their fears, to heal their anxieties, and to help them accomplish the task that had been commissioned of them to do. I'll tell you this, everybody, including pastors, will occasionally have to do something they don't want to do. You ever have to do something you didn't want to do? You've never been a parent then if you didn't have to do something you didn't want to do. I'm, I'm pretty even keeled, but there are times when I get a little anxious about some things, and, it, and it's typically if I ever have to confront someone on an issue of some kind. And I found that I need to pray through, and I need to get in prayer, and I need to get past that certain point of anxiousness. I've learned by facing it, first and foremost in prayer, is the key. And it helps me to be sure that my motives are pure. You never want to confront people if you aren't going in pure motives, period. You'll do more damage than you do good. Either to the relationship or to your witness in Christ. It'll never go well. But when you're acting in love and God goes before you, you will find more peace in the process and a better chance of a peaceful solution and a successful outcome. I wonder if you've ever thought about these ladies in the text. And you ever thought, were their fears justified? Absolutely their fears were justified. Consider that Rome had already crucified Jesus. Why not his followers? And if that were not enough, we learned from the text that some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened, and they came up with some crazy story, and they're blaming his followers. So now, everybody's looking at his followers. Who was it that stole the body? Who's causing the problems? And, uh, and in case you didn't know, if a Roman soldier was supposed to guard someone or something, and they failed to do so, they could be executed and their families, entire families were wiped out. If a Roman soldier failed to, to hold his post, guard, a, guard maybe a, uh, somebody who was a prisoner, or in this case, a tomb, you'd think they could guard a tomb, uh, but they couldn't because God was behind it. But they could be executed and their entire family. So the soldiers, I'm telling you, they were scared, the ladies were scared, Everybody was worried how this was going to play out. And they had just cause to be concerned. 
life and death issues here, folks. And it, it, their government wasn't playing. They would do something. And so the ladies knew this, and they figured the soldiers would blame all their problems on them and in an effort to save themselves and their families. They knew that that's probably what would happen. So they had no idea that the Jewish chief priests and elders were cooking up some lie or they agreed on a cover story for the guards who could still potentially lose their family. So the fact is you and I rarely have need to fear for our lives. Very rarely. But imagine how stressed we were just going through the disaffiliation process. Was anybody else a little stressed over that deal? There was stress. Lives weren't at stake. At least our personal lives weren't at stake. Imagine how stressed these ladies were, life threatened. How much more anxious these blessed women of God might have the right to be, while still suffering from incredible grief from Jesus, still dealing with grief, trying to put the pieces together and figure all this out. I wonder, what is it that stresses you today? What are you stressed about today? What is it that you worried about when you woke up this morning, or stewing over, or allowing to steal your joy in Christ Jesus. What stresses, what anxieties, what, what's tugging at your mind and at your heart today? Jesus would say to you, fear not, for I am with you always. Many of you have the internal dialogue going on that says, Pastor, I'm not one of those people. I don't have any anxiety. I don't have fears. I'm not dealing with any of that. But, but just know this, if you don't admit your fears and your anxiousness, you're rarely ever going to get relief from them. They'll gnaw at you. They'll grow. They'll get bigger. You have to admit your fears, your anxieties, before you can call out to God and seek His help. So admit your fears. Because once you're honest with yourself about a source of worry, you can, you can bring those concerns to God for help. You can petition God to help you with those concerns. Maybe help your mind work around that to figure out how to get past the stress or Maybe it's just personal worry, or maybe it's something you need to figure out an answer to. But God will help you discern that. Paul wrote that we should talk to God about everything by prayers and petitions, present your requests to God. How can you do that if you first don't admit what your need is? Presenting everything to God in prayer includes the obvious and, and also hidden concerns. Presenting everything should include first the fears that are easy to admit, like a child's illness or needed income, something immediate that you can put your finger on and say, yeah, that's what's going on in my life. I got a sick kid. How many know you'd rather be sick than have your kids or your grandkids sick? Amen. That's an immediate need. You know the need. You, you can go straight to the Lord with that. There's more needs here that we should include. The fears that are embarrassing to confess, like the consequences of a bad mistake or the real consequences of a wrong choice. Sometimes we need to say, you know, Lord, I, I messed up. I should have come to you, Lord, and I didn't. I made this decision on my own, and I did my own thing. I'm sorry. I repent. Forgive me. Help me through this. We need to admit it sometimes. And third, the fears that we may not understand, like what might cause a loss of sleep or worse, a panic attack. Sometimes we need to say, what is going on in me? that's causing this. I don't know, God. Show me. Reveal it to me. Help me with it so that we can deal with it together. Whatever you feel that is amiss, admit it to God. Amen? No matter how big or how small, God is able to deal with all our needs and wants us to, to come to Him in all things, even the small stuff. There is no small stuff with God. That's part of relationships. So my wife tells me, she said, I want to know what's going on. Why didn't you tell me you were bugged about that? I said, well, I didn't want to bother you with that. She said, that's what happens in relationships. That's what you do. Yes, ma'am. I'm getting better at it. I still got some ways to go, but I'm getting better. A little better. She's just a very little. I'm kind of stubborn that way, I guess. Your problems will seem big if you don't have a personal relationship with the creator of the cosmos. But if you will take your eyes off your problems and focus more intently on Jesus the Christ, 
you're going to realize just how small your problems are in conjunction with your God. The closer you get to God, the smaller your problems will be. That is a fact. When you grasp how big and powerful your God is, your problems are going to shrink. I mean shrink drastically in comparison. And once we admit our fears, we get a better perspective of God, we can move on to the next step. Ask God to take action. You've got to identify it. You've got to put your finger on it so that you can identify it and say, God, this is the specific need I have. I need this. Help me with it. Request it from an all-powerful God. The Bible is filled with examples of people who ask God to intervene in a specific situation. Sometimes he chose to act very clearly, concisely, and even miraculously. And at other times, God was doing something greater that was yet to be understood in the minds of the people and the prayers would be answered at a later time. Abraham was told, go to a land I'm going to give you. He never got it. It was never his. He was just a sojourner. He just wandered around. and God told him to go, but he believed God for it. Sometimes God has a greater plan than taking away our short-term suffering. Sometimes there's a greater plan. If you recall, Jesus himself asked his father to take away that cup of suffering from him. But Jesus knew that enduring the cross would bring about our greater good. And it was necessary for the redemption of the world, so he did it. But that's why Jesus' most anxious prayer to the Father included the words, Not my will, but your will be done. Jesus knew what he had to do. He wasn't going to pray against it. He said, Lord, I'll, if there's another way, show me. But if this is the only way, not my will, your will be done. Sometimes we even need to pray against our own desires. And that's what he was doing there. I don't know if you caught that. He said, God, not what I would desire, but what you desire and what you need me to do. May that be the thing I'm faithful to accomplish. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul wrote, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. Like a child who asks a godly parent to meet his or her needs, we too can boldly ask our Heavenly Father to act on our behalf and on the behalf of others. At times, God will give us what we ask for, and at other times, God may have a better plan to work out our future or in someone else's future. But God does hear and answers prayer. Might not always be the way we want it to be. Not my will. Thy will be done. Regardless of what answers you get, or the answers you're waiting for, hear me. Give thanks to God. This is key. This is, this is the basis for everything in Christian life. Give thanks to God. It is almost impossible to be truly thankful and discontent at the same time. Did you hear me? It's practically impossible to be truly thankful and discontent in the same moment. That's why something spiritually powerful happens when we give God thanks before we ever see the result. And especially when we might not yet feel grateful for the answer to that particular need. It's easy to thank God when you've got everything you want. It's a different matter to thank God when you're in the midst of your storm. But that's when you need to thank Him the most. Thank Him for what you have. Thank Him for what you have. And thank Him for what you've yet to get. If you can thank God, you'd be surprised at the power that comes from that. And the sense of peace that will permeate your being when you are truly thankful. But you and I can focus on giving God thanks for the many things that we already have. We can practice thanking Him for the pending needs, and including the ones we just asked Him to help us with, but follow the advice of Paul and give thanks to God at all times and take your mind off your problem and, and give God thanks for what He's done. I mean, think of it. God gave you life. He gave you family, friends, food, shelter, clothing. Make a list. You know, when I, when I counsel people that are going through hard times, I say, I want you to take a piece of paper out, and on the one side, I want you to write down everything God's done for you. And I mean everything. Well, what do you mean? Well, you were born. Let's start there. A lot of kids never get born. I mean, 
mean, look at the numbers of abortion in this country. The fact that you were born is a miracle in and of itself. Let's start with that. You were born. Your parents raised you. They let you live even when you were a stinker pot. They let you live. They didn't beat you to death when you probably deserved to be beat to death. Well, yeah, there's that. And just on down the line, when you start making people see what they have to be thankful for, it makes them take their minds off of the problem and focus on the blessings and the one who gives the blessings. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what your Lord has done. But you've got to count them. You've got to keep them in mind and memory. God had Israel set up numerous times, uh, monuments in different places, just a pile of rocks at one time on the, you know, around the Jordan River there. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Solomon built this big obelisk on both sides of the Red Sea. One has been torn down by a particular country. On the other side of the Red Sea is another obelisk. And if you look at it, and they've gone through this, it says this is where Israel crossed the Red Sea. Dates back to the time of Solomon. And give God thanks for what he's doing. We know that he's able to use the present circumstances in ways that we might not see. So consider asking God in the midst of your hard times what he might be trying to show you as you go through this stress. God, are you trying to teach me something? If so, show me. He'll open my eyes to see it and my ears to hear so I can understand. And give thanks for what he's doing in the world and what he's doing in us, especially if he's doing something in us that we have not yet been able to identify. Thank him for what, what's yet to come to your mind and, and understanding. Ask him what he wants you to learn from the experience and give him thanks for the growth that the lesson will give you. And give thanks for what God will do. I think that's most important. Give thanks for what God is going to do in your future in the coming days. Confident that he works together all things for your good. You'll find that if you're honest about your situation and you're willing to pray long and hard that you will come to a place of peace. Pentecostals call this praying through. And all that means is that they pray until they have a peace of God inside. They just have a peace they're not, so, they're not stressed. They know they still have a problem. They haven't seen the answer to it. But there's something inside that just like clicked. and says, I know God's got it under control. I can't tell you how. I can't tell you when. I can't tell you what's going to happen. But I just sense inside in my spirit that God's, God's got it under control. And I can go out and I can praise Him earnestly and openly and honestly. Knowing there's still something that I haven't seen yet. But I believe in the spirit that has been taken care of. And I have peace. The peace that passes all understanding. The world doesn't understand that. And if you've never had a problem and prayed through to where you have that peace, you may not understand it either. But I promise you this. If you'll pray through till that peace comes, you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. You might not understand how it's possible. But we can still receive that peace in the midst of a storm. We don't, we don't pray only because we know God can change our circumstances. We also pray because prayer has the capacity to change our perspective on life and change how we view our problems. In Paul's words, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You can have it. Even in the midst of a storm and a bad situation, God's peace can come. Spending time honestly admitting our fears to God and asking Him to act in a spirit of thanksgiving places us in an intimate place with Christ. <clears throat> Brings us into His divine peace. In Christ's stress, anxiety and worry will fade away. Prayer is the mode that we need to participate in if we desire to connect our hearts and our minds to that blessed Creator. If you want something from God, you need to ask. Over and over again, Jesus told us to pray for our needs and believe in our hearts that what we ask for will be given. How are you at asking? How are you? Do you believe you will receive what you ask for? I know a lot of people who have a hard time asking for help. They're givers. They're doers. They have a hard time asking anybody for help. I grew up in a family that 
you know, they were farmers and you just fixed stuff yourself. You didn't go down and pay somebody else to do it. You tore it apart and you fixed it. You just did it because frankly, the nearest repair shop was about an hour and a half away. You couldn't just haul a combine off. It's not like you can pick one up on a little 16 foot trailer or something. So you, you had to learn to fix stuff. And, and there's this kind of independent ideology. And, and I know for a lot of guys that grew up like that, it's hard to go to God in prayer and ask for things. But think of God not as your earthly father, but as the heavenly father who wants that relationship with you. Who wants to be in communion with you at all times and in all places. I knew that if I wanted something, I had to ask my earthly father for it. I also knew that if I'd been a stinker recently, asking probably wasn't going to get me anywhere. And at times I might decide I might not be a good idea to ask right now because I might get a lecture about something I did, you know, not too long ago and why I shouldn't be getting what I'm asking for. So every now and then guilt and shame would keep me from asking my father for something. How many of you have allowed guilt and shame to keep you from asking your heavenly father for something you need? A relationship needs to be renewed. There's something wrong in a relationship if you can't just go straight to your Heavenly Father and feel confident He hears and answers prayer. Today, let us begin at the beginning so that we can be sure we have that place in that relationship. Let us repent of our sins, admit our mistakes. Let us admit our fears, our anxieties that keep us from having peace in God. And let us ask God if we are supposed to be learning something from our circumstances. And let us pray until we feel the peace of God that passes all understanding. Then let us praise God for the many wonderful things that He has already done, that which He is doing in us and that which He is about to do. Let us praise God until we feel His presence and experience His peace and are empowered to go back out and be the church He commissioned us to be. Then and only then will we be ready to fulfill the Great Commission. You know the one where I just read a moment ago where Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. That won't happen until we get our hearts and our minds right with God and humble ourselves, learning to be open and honest with God, asking for help and praising Him in the good and the bad for the wonderful things He's done, things He's doing, and that which He has yet to do. And if you're not reaching others with the message of the love and grace of God, there's a good chance you've not allowed yourself to be honest with God and made real headway with your own personal relationship with the Godhead. So today, let us boldly approach the mercy seat. Humble ourselves to the place where we start at the beginning and do some serious introspection. Let us discern our personal motives, our real relationship with God, and, and our lack thereof, and let us humble ourselves honestly before God. Let us have an honest discussion with God about the sins in our lives and in our hearts and let us leave them with God to remove them from our soul's possession and set us free from their bondage. Let us do some real soul work today so that we are capable of being commissioned by God and being the people of God tomorrow. Let us get real today and let us stop the excuses and comparing our sins to those sins of others as though that bears any merit with God. You want to compare yourself to somebody? Compare yourself to Christ and Him alone. He's the only one that matters, the only comparison you need, because we are called to grow in the image of Christ. Not our neighbors, not our pastor, not our previous pastor, not somebody else, not a mom or a dad. We are called to grow in the image of Christ. So let us get real today and consider doing that. And let us give our all to God, asking Him to set us free to be the church, commissioned to reach the lost. But let us start by allowing His Spirit to set us free before we will be effective to communicate to others how they might need to be set free from sin and death. So let us now consider our own honest words with Christ. Before we step into the communion service, 
I want us just to take a moment. We'll bow our heads. Before we receive the sacrament of communion. God, we come to you now. Open our eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, sometimes we fool, try to fool ourselves. Others see the way that we do it, and we don't even recognize that ourselves we've done it so much. We ask you to open our eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit would have us deal with today. If there's any wicked way in us, if there's anything that causes our relationship with you to suffer, if there's fears, anxieties, if there's shame or guilt, whatever it may be, make it known to us. God is speaking to people right now. I believe in that still small voice. Your hearts are being stirred. Lord, we confess these things to you. These fears, these anxieties, these shames, these guilts, the sins. And we ask you to purge and cleanse us. We ask you to forgive us. Renew a right heart in us. Renew us that we might be more in the image of Christ when we leave than we were when we came. And don't just do it here and now in the one time, but God, as we, as we tend to fall back on those things, we think that's who we are, that's not who we are. We are in Christ Jesus from this day forward. And as we tend to fall back and the devil tries to bring us back to those same fears, those same anxiousness, same anxiety, same, same guilt, same shame, as we, as we tend to fall back into that, may the Holy Spirit quicken us and say, no, you are not that. You are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens you. Let us realize who we are in Christ and take authority over those evils that bind us and drag us back. Father, we desire to be the church, to be faithful in the Great Commission, but it starts in our hearts and in our minds. Get us right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.